evening. It's an honor to be here tonight uh, to speak with you. Um, it's an honor to have so many new friends in Minnesota over the years that I've developed who are Muslim, who are really engaging in some extraordinary work in building bridges across religious boundaries, which is the kind of work we need to be doing now more than ever. And so I want to thank IRG for its wonderful work, uh, the reason that we're here tonight. Islamophobia constitutes, I think, one of our greatest moral dilemmas right now at this moment in our nation's political history. By almost every metric, Islamophobia has been on the rise in the last decade. Hate crimes, opposition to the building of mosques, even cemeteries, uh, media framing of Muslims overwhelmingly is negative. We have lots of studies that remind us that this is, continues to be the case. Anti-Muslim legislation from anti-Sharia laws to the so-called Muslim ban. And of course, Islamophobia has been instrumentalized a lot in politics. Uh, and I don't have to rattle off all of these examples, but you remember from a few years ago, uh, candidates flirting with Muslim ID cards, Muslim registration systems, patrolling Muslim neighborhoods, Islam hates us, one candidate said that. It's under these circumstances and these conditions that IRG does its extraordinary work of building bridges between Muslims and their neighbors here in Minnesota. And by the way, this is a model for a lot of people outside Minnesota, even down in Iowa. Tonight I want to offer some reflections on how the rest of us, those of us in the non-Muslim majority, and particularly Christians, which is my own background, how we can do our part to complement the work of IRG in these perilous times. I'm firmly of the belief that if Christians particularly don't step up and do more and start taking the lead on countering Islamophobia and building relationships with their Muslim neighbors, then our nation will continue to struggle with the great sin that is Islamophobia. And all that that entails, remember Islamophobia is not just about some bad ideas or negative attitudes people have about Islam. This stuff gets translated into actions and it can affect the lives and livelihoods of a lot of people. So that's what I want to do tonight, to address some of the work I think needs to be done by Christians, among others in the non-Muslim majority, so that the IRG's efforts can more fully flourish in Minnesota and beyond. Let me begin by saying that we Christians in particular struggle to know how to engage our Muslim neighbors. Our views of Muslims have been distorted by centuries of political and theological antagonisms. This goes back to the Middle Ages. And today, too many of us operate under the assumption that Muslims are prone to violence, that Muslims practice a, uh, practice a religion that oppresses women, that Muslims want to rid the nation of democracy and impose Sharia. We have allowed these prejudices to fester, to go unchecked, and to cloud our judgment. In short, many of us who are Christian are guilty, guilty of assuming the worst of our Muslim neighbors, and this hinders our efforts to engage with Muslims in a healthy, productive manner, to do the kind of work that we need to do to move forward as a nation. So how can we do better? How can we cultivate healthier relationships with Muslims for those of us in the non-Muslim majority? Relationships that assume the best of Muslims and not the worst. So tonight I will discuss three rules of interfaith engagement that I believe can help Christians, amongst others, to do better in their interfaith outreach to Muslims. I am borrowing these rules from someone who's much smarter than I am, uh, the late Christopher Stendhal. Stendhal was a biblical studies scholar. He once was dean of Harvard Divinity School and a bishop in the Church of Sweden, a Lutheran bishop. The rules of interfaith engagement that he created over his career hold much promise for fostering healthy relationships with people from religious traditions that are different from our own. And I'll name them briefly up front, then I'm going to flesh these out a bit, right? Here are the three rules of interfaith engagement. Number one, always let people of other religions define themselves. Never let their enemies do it for them. Number one. Number two, never compare their worst to our best. Number three, develop holy envy, a phrase that Stendhal coined that I'll talk more about in a moment. Develop holy envy of other religions. 
I'm going to adopt and adapt these three rules of engagement as a framework for reaching out to and building healthy relationships with Muslims. Again, complementing the work that IRG does. I believe these rules, in my experience, offer a great first step for Christians and others who are not Muslim to cultivate genuine friendships and relationships with Muslims, but they don't know where to start. There's just a lot of churches, a lot of Christians who have no idea where to start that, that might be inclined to do this work if they had some sort of blueprint. That's what I'm trying to do tonight, a blueprint. And let me add that while I discuss these rules from the perspectives of how, how, how they can guide Christians, you know, people of my own background, people who are in the majority in the United States, I do believe these rules can be used by anyone irrespective of their religious background. I don't think you have to be uh, particularly Christian or there's anything particularly Christian about these rules. Uh, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, others can find value in them as well. Okay, let's get into the rules. Number one, the first rule is always to allow people of other religions to define what their religion means to them and for them. I often paraphrase the rule this way, learn from a religion's practitioners, not from its enemies. It's easy for Christians in America to take for granted our ability to define what Christianity means for us to the larger public. That's something a lot of Christians just take for granted, that no one's out there trying to co-opt the Christian narrative for nefarious purposes, like there is in the Islamophobia industry, for example. Again, that's because we're in the majority, and that's because we have power. Nearly 70% of the population in the United States is Christian. The main political and the main cultural institutions of this nation have historically been dominated by Christians. So this has given us the ability to control the story of how Christianity is told. This is not the case for Muslims. Muslims scarcely make up 1% of the population and have ongoing challenges in defining how the non-Muslim majority understands Islam. The problem is exacerbated by the fact that a very powerful, very well-funded industry, the Islamophobia industry, doesn't want Muslims to tell their own stories. They don't want Muslims to define themselves. People like Pamela Geller, Robert Spencer, Frank Gaffney, and I could go on and on. They go out of their way to demonize Muslims and to present themselves as experts of Islam. And they get paid a lot of money to do it. And over the past decade or so, these people in the Islamophobia industry who were once really on the fringes have increasingly been, been moving into the mainstream and have started to dictate the mainstream political narrative of Islam. They have gained power in Washington and the power to do great harm to Muslims. This industry's influence has extended, in my experience, and speaking about Islamophobia, has, has extended to the broader public. I now encounter narratives that Geller and Spencer peddle in the ordinary population of Americans when I go out and speak. It's not uncommon when I speak on Islamophobia in public for someone attending a, a public lecture to stand up during the Q&A, the question and answer session, uh, and start to try to discredit everything I've just said. All right? And they usually do this by something from the Islamophobia industry. An example would be this guy who might stand up, and it's almost always a guy, uh, who's going to stand up in the back and he's going to open up the Quran, which he's conveniently brought with him, and he's going to open it up to the ninth surah and he's going to quote the sword verse, right? Whenever you encounter idolaters, kill them. He then smiles, closes the book, usually with some sort of emphasis, right? And says that's all he needs to know about Islam. And how does he know what Muslims believe? He's read their book. That's all he needs to know. And it's usually the case that he's read the books of Robert Spencer and Pamela Geller as well. It's a good example of allowing the enemies of Islam to define Islam and not Muslims themselves. The thing is, as I try to remind people like that, that Christians would not dare allow others to define Christianity on their behalf. Christians would not want someone to show up to their church, open up the Bible, to the New Testament and read the following passage from Ephesians. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. Close the New Testament and proclaim that they know everything there is to know about Christianity, that it is a slave religion. Why? Because they've got their book. I don't know of one single Christian who would think that that's acceptable. 
If you want to know how Christians themselves understand the Bible, including that passage, you ask Christians. You read the Bible with and alongside Christians, and this applies to Muslims too. If Christians want to understand how Muslims interpret that verse from the Quran, or any verse from the Quran, we should ask Muslims. We should read the Quran with and alongside our Muslim neighbors and try to see Islam's most sacred text through Muslim eyes. You don't ask the random guy who hates Islam to explain the Quran to you. You don't ask Pamela Geller or Robert Spencer. You ask Muslims. You let Muslims define themselves. That's the first rule of interfaith engagement. And if Christians follow this one rule alone, we wouldn't need the other two I'm about to go on to. Right? That one rule alone would change everything. Okay, second rule. Never take the worst examples of another religion and compare them to our best. Christopher Stendhal once noted that a lot of us are kind of narcissistic when it comes to our own religions. We tend to see the best inside our own religious traditions in their histories and our communities and only find flaws and failures when we look outside our own religion. The temptation for Christians to look to our best and compare it to what we think is the worst of Islam is particularly strong when it comes to peace and violence, in my experience. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard someone ask, well, where is the Muslim Martin Luther King? It's usually not a serious question. It's a rhetorical question. They, they assume they know the answer to it, right? Uh, there is no such thing. The assumption is that Islam only gives us the Osama bin Laden's, right? It doesn't give us peacemakers. But the question is often a deliberate attempt to portray Islam in the worst possible light, trying to take some really bad example and drawing a conclusion about 1.8 billion people. And it's an attempt to compare Christianity and make it seem in its best light, right? Truth is, all religions in their history, right, have had people who claim that religion who are scoundrels. And all religions have people in that tradition who are peacemakers, who are role models. You do not need a PhD in religion to figure that one out. If Christians want to know whether Islam has peacemakers, we don't have to dig too deeply to find lots of examples. It's just that most Christians aren't familiar with them. I usually start with recent Nobel Peace Prize winners, Muhammad Yunus, Tawakal Karman, Malala Yousafzai, among others, have won the Nobel Peace Prize in the past decade or a little bit more, all of whom point to Islam as inspiration for their efforts. All of whom, in giving their Nobel Peace Prize speeches, start with the Bismillah, right? They, they, they frame their entire lives with, around Islam. It's, they're not doing this in spite of Islam, they're doing it because of it. And they're just the tip of the iceberg. And there's also Sakina Yakubi, who founded the Afghan Institute of Learning in 1995 to educate girls and women under the regime of the Taliban. There's Ibu Patel, my friend in Chicago, who established the Interfaith Youth Corps to spearhead interfaith work on college campuses. There's the White Helmets in Syria, a volunteer organization that helps rescue victims of bombings in the Syrian Civil War. Again, all examples of people doing peace work. And again, if you know anything about their careers, you know that they frame all of it with Islam. And then, of course, there's the IRG, an extraordinary work you do to educate Minnesotans on Islam. What you and all of the other people I just mentioned share in common is that you find in Islam the inspiration to promote peace and compassion in this broken world that we live in right now. Just as Martin Luther King represents the best of Christianity, you represent the best of Islam. And it's the best of Islam that deserves much more attention from Christians as we reach out to our Muslim neighbors. The third and final rule of interfaith engagement and it's my favorite one. It's to cultivate what Stendhal called holy envy, H-O-L-Y, holy envy toward other religions. The idea behind this rule is to discover some element within other religions, religions that are not your own, that evoke beauty and a sense of awe within you. This is no small feat when you think about it, because after all, the world's religions have been at odds with one another for a long time. Many of us have not been encouraged to look for beauty in other religious traditions. To develop holy envy toward another religion requires fighting against the impulses 
to diminish other religions at the expense of our own. It also requires us to recalibrate our spiritual radars so that we are more in tune to that which is beautiful and awe-inspiring in religions that are not our own. And this takes practice. It can take years of practice. It also takes some humility. And it takes a willingness to see other religions not necessarily as competitors and certainly not as enemies, but as potential sources of wisdom and insight. If we want a good example of a prominent Christian who has holy envy for Islam, we need to look no further than former President Barack Obama, ironically the person a lot of people assume was a Muslim. When he was first running for the presidency in 2007, he gave an interview to the New York Times. And in that interview, he called the Islamic call to prayer, quote, one of the prettiest sounds on earth at sunset. The call to prayer, mind you, is not part of his Christian heritage but it clearly is a sound that moves his spirit deeply. He is in awe of the call to prayer and the beauty it contains. As for me, well, there's lots about Islam I've come to appreciate over the years. A lot of it's pretty academic uh, in terms of the philosophers I've read over the years and that sort of thing, but, but if I had to name one thing, really, that jumps out to me, that inspires holy envy for me, it's the practice of prayer in Islam and the five daily prayers particularly. And that wasn't always the case. I, I come from a, a Protestant Christian background. Protestant Christians historically have been suspicious of religious practices that we think might come across as mandatory, right? We think this is a form of works of righteousness to use the language of Martin Luther in the 16th century. So as a much younger man, I imagine that Islam's practice of five daily prayers came across as burdensome to me, as a list of things to do, and I had trouble finding beauty in it. But after many, many years of developing friendships with Muslims and observing Muslims at prayer, I've changed my tune considerably. I have deep admiration for the five daily prayers. Part of this is because of their embodied nature. Many Protestant Christians have a tendency to encourage disembodied relationships with our Creator, with the divine. Worship, including prayer in my background, more often than not, has been an activity that takes place from the head up. It's something you do here, and you keep it in here, right? When I watch Muslims at prayer, I have a very different experience of what prayer is and what it can be. Muslims invest their whole bodies in prayer as they prostrate themselves, touch their head to the ground in submission to their creator, the source of their being. It's a beautiful, beautiful sight to behold, and a powerful reminder to me, a Christian, that the entire body is a spiritual conduit connecting us to the divine, not just this. What I also admire is how the frequency of the prayers results in an infusion of the sacred into the secular. The most ordinary of days that pass in our lives, right? The most ordinary of days do not pass for Muslims without Muslims regularly pausing to plug in to the ground of their being and recharge their spiritual batteries. The prayers provide a sacred ordering to ordinary daily life that I find has often been missing in my own and is not something I quite have from my own Christian background. Holy envy is not a ploy, by the way. It's not a ploy to appropriate elements of Islam and make them into our own if we're Christian or anyone else. This is not about spiritual plagiarism. It's an opportunity for Christians to find beauty in Islam and through this beauty to develop an appreciative knowledge of Islam that opens doors to deeper dialogue and more meaningful relationships, which is exactly what we need in an age of Islamophobia. So those are the three rules. Let, other people, let people of other religions define themselves. Never compare their worst to our best. Develop holy envy. And what I love about these rules is they put those of us who are Christian on the right track, I think, when it comes to our moral commitments toward Muslims. All three rules encourage, and I dare say require, that we engage Muslims honestly and with respect for how Muslims understand and practice their own tradition. The three rules illustrate what Christians know as the golden rule, do unto others, 
as you would have them do unto you. But they also illustrate a famous teaching from the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And I paraphrase, none of you truly believes until you wish for others what you wish for yourself. Taken together, the rules provide a solid foundation for interfaith engagement that enables those of us who are Christian to assume the best of our Muslim neighbors. And they also encourage us to develop a genuine curiosity about Islam as it is understood and experienced by Muslims and to move beyond a mere repetition of caricatures and stereotypes that we all too often find in the media and in too many politicians. They require us to assume the role of students with Muslims and Muslim organizations such as IRG as our teachers, as our guides when it comes to understanding Islam. And with greater interfaith understanding comes greater empathy. And that's what we need now more than ever if our pluralistic society has any chance of surviving, let alone thriving. We need a revolution of empathy. In the case of our Muslim neighbors, we Christians will need to imagine ourselves in the shoes of our Muslim neighbors and try to see Islam from their perspective. That's what the work of the IRG is all about from my experience and my perspective, to foster empathy, to provide those of us who are not Muslim with an empathetic perspective of Islam that often eludes many non-Muslims here in the United States. And it's my hope that Christians and others in the non-Muslim majority will do our part to match the extraordinary interfaith work carried out by IRG and it is my hope that we will, in the words of the Quran, vie with one another in good works, compete with one another in good works. And in doing so, we will lead a revolution of empathy that will spread beyond the great state of Minnesota and pave the way for a more peaceful, prosperous nation. Thank you.